Book Eight, Chapters Fourteen and Fifteen of the Antiquities of the Jews, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Antiquities of the Jews, Volume Two by Flavius Josephus, translated by William Whiston. Book Eight, Chapters Fourteen and Fifteen. Chapter Fourteen. How Hadad, king of Damascus and of Syria, made two expeditions against Ahab and was beaten. When the affairs of Ahab were thus, at that very time the son of Hadad, Ben Hadad, who was king of the Syrians and of Damascus, got together an army out of all his country, and procured thirty two kings beyond Euphrates to be his auxiliaries. So he made an expedition against Ahab, but because Ahab's army was not like that of Ben Hadad, he did not set it in array to fight him, but having shut up everything that was in the country in the strongest cities he had, he abode in Samaria himself, for the walls about it were very strong, and it appeared to be not easily to be taken in other respects also. So the king of Syria took his army with him, and came to Samaria, and placed his army round about the city, and besieged it. He also sent a herald to Ahab, and desired he would admit the ambassadors he would send him, by whom he would let him know his pleasure. So, upon the king of Israel's permission for him to send, those ambassadors came, and by their king's command spake thus, that Ahab's riches, and his children, and his wives, were Ben-Hadad's, and if he would make an agreement, and give him leave to take as much of what he had as he pleased, he would withdraw his army, and leave off the siege. Upon this Ahab bade the ambassadors to go back, and tell their king, that both he himself and all that he hath are his possessions. And when these ambassadors had told this to Ben-Hadad, he sent to him again, and desired, since he confessed that all he had was his, that he would admit those servants of his which he should send the next day, and he commanded him to deliver those whom he should send whatsoever, upon their searching his palace, and the houses of his friends and kindred, they should find to be excellent in its kind. But what that did not please them they should leave to him. At this second embassage of the king of Syria, Ahab was surprised, and gathered together the multitude to a congregation, and told them that, for himself, he was ready, for their safety and peace, to give up his own wives and children to the enemy, and to yield to him all his own possessions, for that was what the Syrian king required at his first embassage, but that now he desires to send his servants to search all their houses, and in them leave nothing that is excellent in its kind seeking an occasion of fighting against him, as knowing that I would not spare what is mine own for your sakes, but taking a handle from the disagreeable terms he offers concerning you to bring a war upon us. However, I will do what you shall resolve is fit to be done. But the multitude advised him to hearken to none of his proposals, but to despise him, and be in readiness to fight him. Accordingly, when he had given the ambassadors this answer to be reported, that he still continued in the mind to comply with what terms he had at first desired, for the safety of the citizens, but as for his second desires, he cannot submit to them, he dismissed them. Now when Ben-Hadad heard this, he had imagination, and sent ambassadors to Ahab the third time, and threatened that his army would raise a bank higher than those walls, in confidence of whose strength he despised him, and that by only each man of his army taking a handful of earth, hereby making a show of the great number of his army, and aiming to affright him. Ahab answered that he ought not vaunt himself when he had only to put on his armor, but when he should have conquered his enemies in the battle. So the ambassadors came back, and found the king at supper with his thirty-two kings, and informed him of Ahab's answer, who immediately gave order for proceeding thus, to make lines round the city, and to raise a bulwark, and to prosecute the siege in all manner of ways. Now, as this was doing, Ahab was in a great agony, and all his people with him. But he took courage, and was freed from his fears, upon a certain prophet coming to him, and saying to him, that God had promised to subdue so many tens of thousands of his enemies under him. And when he inquired by whose means the victory was to be obtained, he said, By the sons of the princes, but under thy conduct as their leader, by reason of their unskilfulness in war. Upon which he called for the sons of the princes, and found them to be two hundred and thirty-two persons. So when he was informed that the king of Syria had betaken himself to feasting and repose, he opened the gates, and sent out the prince's sons. 
Now when the sentinels told Ben-Hadad of it, he sent some to meet them, and commanded them that if these men were come out for fighting, they should bind them, and bring them to him, and that if they came out peaceably, they should do the same. Now Ahab had another army ready within the walls, but the sons of the princes fell upon the outguard, and slew many of them, and pursued the rest of them to the camp. And when the king of Israel saw that these had the upper hand, he sent out all the rest of his army, which falling suddenly upon the Syrians beat them, for they did not think they would have come out, on which account it was that they assaulted him when they were naked and drunk, insomuch that they left all their armor behind them when they fled out of the camp, and the king himself escaped with difficulty, by fleeing away on horseback. But Ahab went a great way in pursuit of the Syrians, and when he had spoiled their camp, which contained a great deal of wealth, and moreover a large quantity of gold and silver, he took Ben-Hadad's chariots and horses, and returned to the city. But as the prophet told him he ought to have his army ready, because the Syrian king would make another expedition against him the next year, Ahab was busy in making provision for it accordingly. Now Ben-Hadad, when he had saved himself, and as much of his army as he could out of the battle, he consulted with his friends how he might make another expedition against the Israelites. Now those friends advised him not to fight with them on the hills, because their god was potent in such places, and thence it had come to pass that they had very lately been beaten. But they said, that if they joined battle with them in the plain, they should beat them. They also gave him this further advice, to send home those kings whom he had brought as his auxiliaries, but to retain their army, and to set captains over it instead of the kings, and to raise an army out of their country, and let them be in the place of the former who had perished in the battle, together with horses and chariots. So he judged their counsel to be good, and acted according to it in the management of the army. At the beginning of the spring Ben-Hadad took his army with him, and led it against the Hebrews, and when he was come to a certain city which was called Aphek, he pitched his camp in the great plain. Ahab also went to meet him with his army, and pitched his camp over against him, although his army was a very small one, if it were compared with the enemy's. But the prophet came again to him, and told him that God would give him the victory, that he might demonstrate his own power to be, not only on the mountains, but on the plains also, which it seems was contrary to the opinion of the Syrians. So they lay quiet in their camp seven days, but on the last of those days, when the enemies came out of their camp and put themselves in array in order to fight, Ahab also brought out his own army, and when the battle was joined they fought valiantly. He put the enemy to flight, and pursued them, and pressed them, and slew them. Nay, they were destroyed by their own chariots, and by one another, nor could any more than a few of them escape to their own city Aphek, who were also killed by the walls falling upon them, being in number twenty-seven thousand. Now there were slain in this battle a hundred thousand more, but Ben-Hadad, the king of the Syrians, fled away with certain others of his most faithful servants, and hid himself in a cellar underground. And when these told him that the kings of Israel were humane and merciful men, and that they might make use of the usual manner of supplication, and obtain deliverance from Ahab, in case he would give them leave to go to him, he gave them leave accordingly. So they came to Ahab, clothed in sackcloth, with ropes about their heads, for this was the ancient manner of supplication among the Syrians, and said, that Ben-Hadad desired he would save him, and that he would ever be a servant to him for that favor. Ahab replied that he was glad he was alive, and not hurt in the battle, and he further promised him the same honor and kindness that a man would show to his brother. So they received assurances upon oath from him, that when he came to him he should receive no harm from him, and then went and brought him out of the cellar wherein he was hid, and brought him to Ahab as he sat in his chariot. So Ben-Hadad worshipped him, and Ahab gave him his hand, and made him come up to him in his chariot, and kissed him, and bid him be of good cheer, and not to expect that any mischief should be done to him. So Ben-Hadad returned him thanks, and professed that he would remember his kindness to him in all the days of his life, and promised he would restore those cities of the Israelites which the former kings had taken from them, and grant that he should have leave to come to Damascus, as his forefathers had come to Samaria. So they confirmed their covenant by oaths, and Ahab made him many presents, and sent him back to his own kingdom. And this was the conclusion of the war that Ben-Hadad made against Ahab and the Israelites. But a certain prophet, whose name was Micaiah, 
came to one of the Israelites, and bid him smite him on the head, for by so doing he would please God. But when he would not do so, he foretold to him, that since he disobeyed the commands of God, he should meet with a lion, and be destroyed by him. When that sad accident had befallen the man, the prophet came to another, and gave him the same injunction. So he smote him, and wounded his skull, upon which he bound up his head, and came to the king, and told him that he had been a soldier of his, and had the custody of one of the prisoners committed to him by an officer, and that the prisoner, being run away, he was in danger of losing his own life by the means of that officer, who had threatened him, that if the prisoner escaped he would kill him. And when Ahab said that he would justly die, he took off the binding about his head, and was known by the king to be Micaiah the prophet, who had made use of this artifice as a prelude to his following words. For he said that God would punish him who had suffered Ben-Hadad, a blasphemer against him, to escape punishment, and that he would so bring it about that he should die by the other's means, and that he would so bring it about that he should die by the other's means, and his people by the other's army. Upon which Ahab was very angry at the prophet, and gave commandment that he should be put in prison, and there kept. But for himself he was in confusion at the words of Micaiah, and returned to his own house. CHAPTER fifteen, CONCERNING JEHOSHAPHAT, THE KING OF JERUSALEM, AND HOW AHAB MADE AN EXPEDITION AGAINST THE SYRIANS, AND WAS ASSISTED THEREIN BY JEHOSHAPHAT, BUT WAS HIMSELF OVERCOME IN BATTLE, AND PERISHED THEREIN. AND THESE WERE THE CIRCUMSTANCES IN WHICH AHAB WAS. BUT I NOW RETURN TO JEHOSHAPHAT, THE KING OF JERUSALEM, WHO, WHEN HE HAD AUGMENTED HIS KINGDOM, HAD SET GARRISONS IN THE CITIES OF THE COUNTRIES BELONGING TO HIS SUBJECTS and had put such garrisons no less into those cities which were taken out of the tribe of Ephraim by his grandfather Abijah, when Jeroboam reigned over the ten tribes, than he did into the other. But then he had God favorable and assisting to him, as being both righteous and religious, and seeking to do somewhat every day that should be agreeable and acceptable to God. The kings also that were round about him honored him with the presents they made him, till the riches that he had acquired were immensely great, and the glory he had gained was of a most exalted nature. Now in the third year of this reign he called together the rulers of the country, and the priests, and commanded them to go round the land, and teach all the people that were under him, city by city, the laws of Moses, and to keep them, and to be diligent in the worship of God. With this the whole multitude was so pleased, that they were not so eagerly set upon or affected with anything so much as the observation of the laws. The neighboring nations also continued to love Jehoshaphat, and to be at peace with him. The Philistines paid their appointed tribute, and the Arabians supplied him every year with three hundred and sixty lambs, and as many kids of the goats. He also fortified the great cities, which were many in number, and of great consequence. He prepared also a mighty army of soldiers and weapons against their enemies. Now the army of men that wore their armor was three hundred thousand of the tribe of Judah, of whom Adna was the chief, but John was chief of two hundred thousand. The same man was chief of the tribe of Benjamin, and had two hundred thousand archers under him. There was another chief, whose name was Jehozabad, who had a hundred and fourscore thousand armed men. This multitude was distributed to be ready for the king's service, besides those whom he sent to the best fortified cities. Jehoshaphat took for his son Jehoram to wife the daughter of Ahab, the king of the ten tribes, whose name was Athaliah. And when, after some time, he went to Samaria, Ahab received him courteously, and treated the army that followed him in a splendid manner, with great plenty of corn and wine, and of slain beasts, and desired that he would join with him in his war against the king of Syria, that he might recover from him the city of Ramoth in Gilead. For though it had belonged to his father, yet had the king of Syria's father taken it away from him and upon Jehoshaphat's promise to afford him his assistance, for indeed his army was not inferior to the other, and his sending for his army from Jerusalem to Samaria, the two kings went out of the city, and each of them sat on his own throne, and each gave their orders to their several armies. Now Jehoshaphat bid them call some of the prophets, if there were any there, and inquire of them concerning this expedition against the king of Syria whether they would give them counsel to make that expedition at this time, for there was peace at that time between Ahab and the king of Syria, which had lasted three years, from the time he had taken him captive till that day. 
So Ahab called his own prophets, being in number about four hundred, and bid them inquire of God whether he would grant him the victory, if he made an expedition against Ben-Hadad, and enable him to overthrow that city, for whose sake it was that he was going to war. Now these prophets gave their counsel for making this expedition, and said that he would beat the king of Syria, and, as formerly, would reduce him under his power. But Jehoshaphat, understanding by their words that they were false prophets, asked Ahab whether there were not some other prophet, and he belonging to the true God, that would have surer information concerning futurities. Hereupon Ahab said there was indeed such a one, but that he hated him, as having prophesied evil to him, and having foretold that he should be overcome and slain by the king of Syria, and that for this cause he had him now in prison, and that his name was Micaiah, the son of Imla. But upon Jehoshaphat's desire that he might be produced, Ahab sent a eunuch, who brought Micaiah to him. Now the eunuch had informed him by the way, that all the other prophets had foretold the king should gain the victory, but he said that it was not lawful for him to lie against God, but that he must speak what he should say to him about the king, whatsoever it were. When he came to Ahab, and he had adjured him on oath to speak the truth to him, he said that God had shown to him the Israelites running away, and pursued by the Syrians, and dispersed upon the mountains by them, as flocks of sheep are dispersed when their shepherd is slain. He said further that God had signified to him that those Israelites should return in peace to their own home, and that he only should fall in the battle. When Micaiah had thus spoken, Ahab said to Jehoshaphat, I told thee a little while ago the disposition of the man with regard to me, and that he uses to prophesy evil to me. Upon which Micaiah replied that he ought to hear all, whatsoever it be that God foretells, and that in particular they were false prophets that encouraged him to make this war in hopes of victory, whereas he must fight and be killed. Whereupon the king was in suspense with himself, but Zedekiah, one of those false prophets, came near, and exhorted him not to hearken to Micaiah, for he did not at all speak truth, as a demonstration of which he instanced in what Elijah had said, who was a better prophet in foretelling futurities than Micaiah, for he foretold that the dog should lick his blood in the city of Jezreel, in the field of Naboth, as they licked the blood of Naboth, who by his means was there stoned to death by the multitude, that therefore it was plain that this Micaiah was a liar, as contradicting a greater prophet than himself, and saying that he should be slain at three days' journey distance. And, said he, you shall soon know whether he be a true prophet, and hath the power of the divine spirit, for I will smite him, and let him then hurt my hand, as Jadon caused the hand of Jeroboam the king to wither when he would have caught him, for I suppose thou hast certainly heard of that accident. So when, upon his smiting Micaiah, no harm happened to him, Ahab took courage, and readily led his army against the king of Syria, for as I suppose, fate was too hard for him, and made him believe that the false prophet spake truer than the true one, that it might take an occasion of bringing him to his end. However, Zedekiah made horns of iron, and said to Ahab, that God made those horns signals, that by them he should overthrow all Syria. But Micaiah replied, that Zedekiah, in a few days, should go from one secret chamber to another to hide himself, that he might escape the punishment of his lying. Then did the king give orders that they should take Micaiah away, and guard him to Ammon, the governor of the city, to give him nothing but bread and water. Then did Ahab and Jehoshaphat the king of Jerusalem take their forces, and march to Ramath, a city of Gilead. And when the king of Syria heard of this expedition, he brought out his army to oppose them, and pitched his camp not far from Ramoth. Now Ahab and Jehoshaphat had agreed that Ahab should lay aside his royal robes, but that the king of Jerusalem should put on his, Ahab's, proper habit, and stand before the army, in order to disprove by this artifice what Micaiah had foretold. But Ahab's fate found him out without his robes, for Ben-Hadad, the king of Assyria, had charged his army, by the means of their commanders, to kill nobody else but only the king of Israel. So when the Syrians, upon their joining the battle with the Israelites, saw Jehoshaphat stand before the army, and conjectured that he was Ahab, they fell violently upon him, and encompassed him round. But when they were near, and knew that it was not he, they all returned back, and while the fighting lasted from the morning till late in the evening, and the Syrians were conquerors, they killed nobody, as their king had commanded them. 
and when they sought to kill Ahab alone, but could not find him, there was a young nobleman belonging to King Ben-Hadad, whose name was Naaman. He drew his bow against the enemy, and wounded the king through his breastplate in his lungs. Upon this Ahab resolved not to make his mischance known to his army, lest they should run away. But he bid the driver of his chariot to turn it back, and carry him out of the battle, because he was sorely and mortally wounded. However, he sat in his chariot and endured the pain till sunset, and then he fainted away and died. And now the Syrian army, upon the coming on of the night, retired to their camp, and when the herald belonging to the camp gave notice that Ahab was dead, they returned home, and they took the dead body of Ahab to Samaria, and buried it there. But when they had washed his chariot in the fountain of Jezreel, which was bloody with the dead body of the king, they acknowledged that the prophecy of Elijah was true, for the dogs licked his blood, and the harlots continued afterwards to wash themselves in that fountain. But still he died at Ramath, as Micaiah had foretold. And as what things were foretold should happen to Ahab by the two prophets came to pass, we ought thence to have high notions of God, and everywhere to honor and worship him, and never to suppose that what is pleasant and agreeable is worthy of belief before what is true, and to esteem nothing more advantageous than the gift of prophecy, and that foreknowledge of future events which is derived from it, since God shows men thereby what we ought to avoid. We may guess, from what happened to this king, and have no reason to consider the power of fate, that there is no way of avoiding it, even when we know it. It creeps upon human souls, and flatters them with pleasing hopes, till it leads them about to the place where it will be too hard for them. Accordingly, Ahab appears to have been deceived thereby, till he disbelieved those that foretold his defeat, but by giving credit to such as foretold what was grateful to him, was slain, and his son, Azahiah, succeeded him. End of Book 8 Chapters 14 and 15 End of Book 8